down. We start. We have uh, the pleasure and the honor to have with us Professor Musas. We don't know him because he's not working on galactic dynamics. Uh, he worked on uh, space physics, a distinguished professor at the University of Athens. And for more than uh, 20 years now, he has another branch of research that it is in general, let's say, archaeoastronomy, but his specialty is the study of this uh, wonderful object that you had the opportunity to see, uh, uh, let's, let's say, a replica of it at the Observatory of Athens uh, the, the first day, uh, last Sunday. Now, uh, he will take us to the details of uh, this uh, mechanism. What could it do? It is amazing, of course, the time that all that was taking place. And uh, I think it is the best uh, way to relax af after the, the heavy program we had during the day. So, Professor Musas, uh, you have. Thank, thank you again very much for honoring me with uh, this invitation to your uh, uh, conference with the youth of uh, galactic dynamics. I'm very honored to be Lipanos. Very welcome to Athens and Greece, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in this uh, lecture, I will present to you an ancient instrument, which is uh, like a double-faced clock, sort of grandmother's clock. One Greek foot is the height, half of it the width, and the third dimension is slightly smaller than what you see here, but we have it like this for you to be able to see inside. It is the earliest known computer, at least the earliest complex one, which is programmed, believe it or not, with gears, a bit difficult to change them. First of all, to design them. And even the most important and most difficult is to conceive that we humans can predict natural phenomena, a big step. Because as Plato says, the first gods of humans were the stars. They mean, he means planets as well, because they include the planets in the stars, in the sense that they are up in the sky. And in the term planets, they include the sun and the moon, because they move. Planet means the moving one. It is a, an instrument with uh, pointers, as you see, several scales. So the output comes in both phases of the instrument in uh, helicoidal scales. These are simple Archimedean spirals that you are very familiar with, both of them, because they want to have a very long scale. And if you only have a circle, you cannot divide it in, uh, let's say, 235 divisions here. No, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, 20, 235 and 223 here to predict the eclipses. There are several smaller ones that also give you information of time. It synchronizes various um, calendars that uh, 
prehistoric people already have probably for millennia all over the earth. Most of them are lunisolar. So they combine the two. And as you know very well, it is very difficult to divide the year in exact lunar months. And this led to the development of very advanced mathematics. So we really owe a lot to the fact that the moon goes around the sun in one year for 12 and something months. So this combines several of these lunisolar um, calendars. And believe it or not, or not, all of them are based on celestial resonances of the sun, of course, the earth, the two basic ones, the moon, the third basic, and again, very surprising to other planets. The Olympic Games that we have, we just had this year, are regulated by an eight year calendar, which is a resonance of, of course, the Earth, the Sun, eight years, the Moon, 99 months, 99 months, and Venus, five synodic periods. All these and many more are in this machine. That also gives the eclipses and the phases of the moon. It also gives the perigee and apogee of the moon during the month with a, a quasi-acceptable Kepler second law approximation using simplified Fourier series, just two terms, which are the epicycles, of course. And uh, Fourier, in his uh, um, analysis, from which the uh, Fourier series that we all use uh, almost every day, says that he has been inspired by the epicycles. So many thanks to all of you for uh, coming and uh, Yeah, that's a good thing. Okay. Uh, it's okay, I can use the... Okay, no problem. We are ready. So, we'll see some early examples of... Uh, uh, So, you see, resonances have played a very important role in the development of science. You know this very much better than me, I suppose, but uh, it goes back some millennia at least. And uh, I call that the cosmic dance. You study them every day, so we are in the same club. Many thanks to all of you. Now, this instrument you can visit, you can see at uh, the National Archaeological Museum. And it is really worth going there if you have an extra day. And. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, you will be satisfied with 
for all the rest that it is uh, uh, in the museum, um, but especially with this one. Uh, since my house is just three blocks from the museum, I used to go there since I was a child. And astronomy was my hobby. Mathematics was um, my greatest love at the time, still is. And for this, I had to stop in this um, showcase where the mechanism was with the name Astrolab. Astrolab in Greek means an instrument that enables you to touch the stars. So it's really <laughs> magical. And uh, it also had a few gears on it, which was a great surprise. So the instrument was out of place, out of time. Why in a museum with Greek um, ancient things? And how on earth it has um, gears? And why these people 21 or so centuries ago have any interest in astronomy without telescopes, let alone spacecraft? At the time, they were not, because I was born in 1947. And obviously, well, you know, this. Uh, uh, we enter in the space era 10 years later. Um, but uh, this interest probably then urged me or pushed me to become a physicist um, and an astronomer uh, a bit later. So I always wonder how it works. And uh, as in the lectures, I, in my lectures of uh, astrophysics, I include, and all lectures in general, I include a, a small introduction of the history of more or less every chapter so that we can all understand how physics, astronomy evolves I had to include, perhaps for no more than three or five minutes, this instrument to show to the students that people have this interest for millennia. And with some of them, um, after lecture, we had the opportunity to discuss that it was a very interesting endeavor to start one day the study of the mechanism. So I'm really very happy that I had the opportunity 20 years ago to uh, gradually start. And this is one of the very first radiographs we obtained in October 2005. You see how complex it is and how the surface of it is also quite complex. In fact, this one is not just a photograph. It is the result of uh, 40 normal images that we have fitted a surface using polynomials. And then uh, from every pixel, we can extract the rust, let's say, and see better the instrument. And also, we can um, light it from any angle we like in our computer. This is also very educational. So that's how we know now the structure. And this is a model we have just constructed with uh, my Mexican friends that uh, now we have an astronomical clock that is also a planetarium that shows the face of the moon, the position of the sun in the five uh, easily visible planets. Of course, I have to thank all the group, and here is the greatest 
group that you can see, and the names of even more people that have contributed to. So this is what you can see in the museum, the three largest pieces. It has a manual, we'll see it better. This is one of the spirals of Archimedes with uh, this particular one contains the phases of the moon. It is the metonic cycle, 19 years, used in several calendars. For example, it was, it, it was this one, the metonic cycle, was introduced in Athens at the time of Socrates. And it is the one we use for Easter today, for Passover. It is used with some variations in all the Hinduistic calendars, if I understand properly. And it has similarities with other calendars, uh, Buddhist calendars that are the continuation of uh, Hinduistic, of course. This is the gear of the sun. Several others, that one is the one of uh, Olympic Games because it predicts one day start. And uh, the manual and some simple scales and the uh, spiral ones, as we said. This is what you can see in the museum, all the 82 large and small fragments. It was in a shipwreck that probably sang around 80 to 60 BC. The actual instrument is much older and uh, it was a very large uh, vessel, uh, something like 40 meters by 12 or so, full of treasures. This is the so-called philosopher. And uh, this is the structure of the largest fragment. Here you see coaxial system, uh, gears of various types, and other uh, very complex mechanical parts. We just part, passed uh, four of these gears that give the variable velocity to the moon. We'll see it in a while again. So at the center is the Earth. This is another part. The moon is here at the top left. And as it goes around the Earth, it changes phases and speed, quite realistically. The manual, these are the laws of physics for the prediction of, uh, uh, here is the phases of the moon, the 19-year cycle, another 76-year cycle again for the phases of the moon, and uh, the prediction of eclipses, lunar and solar. And here are the resonances it contains. As I said before, it is always the sun, the earth, and the moon. And then you need to have the faces of the moon for the calendars and the um, uh, draconic cycle for the eclipses, again the moon. And of course, you have the phases of the Earth for the prediction of eclipses. We have already mentioned the eight-year cycle, which is, uh, again, a prehistoric calendar, I believe. We don't have time to go to it. And 
two very unexpected, almost half a millennium cycles, which are mentioned by numbers in the manual. That was a great surprise. One is 462 years. It is Venus and also it's Mars and Jupiter, although it is difficult to accept really that it is this resonance. But if you divide the 462 years by the synodic periods of uh, Venus, Jupiter, and Mars, you are almost convinced. By the way, there is a double periodicity of this one in an ancient uh, Mesopotamian uh, uh, text. So it fits with this knowledge, if you like. And there is another 40, 442 years, which again is uh, uh, Saturn, Mars, and Mercury. Of course, you have to take an appropriate synodic period for the planets measured in days. And in ancient texts, including the Antikythera mechanism, we have various numbers for the synodic periods of all the planets. This is in the manual not in the gears, but again, very interesting. So this is the calendar of 19 years that we use today for Easter and more. There is a period of 76 years, four times the previous one of 19, that is assumed to be more accurate depends upon the year you use for it. And the eight year calendar that we use for the Olympic games and not only here it says Olympia in Greek means Olympic games. And the, the other. And the other. Um, important for the Greeks festivities, games. They were really competitions, not only athletic, but also music, poetry, theatrical, although this varies. Um, I think I mentioned poetry, if not, I repeat it. Now, all these are based on the laws of physics. And they understand the existence of laws of physics, causality at least, from prehistoric times. Because we have buildings 9,000 years ago that saw the sunrise at Christmas, solstice, and this comes time and time again, or all the years after that, more or less. The same applies for equinox and so on. And of course, they use them for calendars. And uh, in our sort of mythology, uh, humans try to understand the cosmos. And in fact, in the uh, next room, you can see a mural, a fresco, that has Prometheus. And that's why I say here that it is a hybrid. It, it is really a, an insult to God. This really means hybrid. And uh, of course, people have, in parallel, this mixed feeling. 
but we have to predict when it's going to rain. This is the important thing. All the calendars are for this, or most of them. And they need it for agriculture. And 9,000 years ago, they started sort of massively in Greece and, of course, almost everywhere. So it is an angi that is above all deities, Plato says, not only Plato, many others. And then you have uh, three ladies, that, that sort of lady, uh, excuse me, deities, again, very, very strong. Um, Atropos is the one you have to follow. So it is the law of physics. You cannot change it. You cannot change its course. It means atropos. Then you have a clotho that turns the world around, if I exp uh, understand it well. And then you have legacies. That is the random thing. You know very well what random means. But it is already in mythology for at least three, three millennia. And it is very important. And this comes continuously. So these are included in the mechanism. Mm -hmm. Here again, we have uh, these three ladies and the 12 Greek gods. I mean, gods in that time, they don't mean exactly what we mean today. But we don't have time to go to it. And uh, these cosmic dances uh, that uh, we have discovered in ancient um, terracotta of the fourth and third millennium BC come time and time again. Uh, we know from the number of dots repeated in some terracotta, that they are referred to Venus, for example, because you have 584 time and time again, the synodic period. And then comes Jupiter's synodic period. These are the most frequent. And the dances are with five or seven bodies, humans, usually ladies, though. And few words about the uh, shipwreck. This was, this is the small vessel that discovered uh, the shipwreck. This is the ship owner, one of the three, in fact. It was very expensive endeavor this time to do it. And since its discovery, it is in the national archaeological museum. This is the one we created with my Mexican friends that we are very proud of. It has all the planets. Of course, it has the moon with the faces. Uh, it shows the perigee and the apogee. It shows the new moon properly. Uh, And of course, the position of the sun, the Olympiads. And I hope that I will persuade, I have tried this time with the French, persuade the, to persuade them to include the mechanism in the opening ceremony or the closing one. I was not successful. But uh, anyway, a lot of uh, Greek mythology was in the allegories of uh, of the ceremony of uh, the opening. Although many people were not very satisfied. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the mechanism shows quite well the position of the planets. Of course, you have to readjust it every now and then. Because the accuracy is the result of the division 
of two integer numbers, usually prime numbers for economy, to be the less inexpensive, uh, as inexpensive as possible. And uh, here exactly it shows when the opening of, of the Olympic occurs. This is the group of my friends, our group, but all the rest are Mexicans from the University of Sonora. And uh, this is the day we just established it there, last year in November. I'm grateful to all these people. And of course, we are very close friends. It is already an attraction for tourists. So the tourist bus of the city stops there, there and they have a, a go with the astronomers of uh, the, the university. Oh. Um. Okay. Αν θέλετε το το ρυθμίστε, ευχαριστώ πολύ. And uh, let me tell you as a parenthesis, and of course uh, we can have as many questions as you like. Uh, that uh, we have developed an educational program, a program, excuse me, that you can have it in your institutes. I have it in 15 languages, not exactly the same in all, but uh, nevertheless uh, equally useful. It has uh, two simulations, interactive or quasi-interactive. And uh, so a visitor, even a child of five, six years, can play and can discover by her own, his, himself, uh, themselves, they can discover how the simulation works. I've seen it time and time again, even for children of five, and I enjoy it. That's why I have to tell you, <laughs> and I'm sure you will enjoy it. Um, we are very proud that uh, you can have this exhibition anytime you like with everything. And if you want to buy one of them, you are very welcome. But uh, I mean, I, I don't sell it. I buy it too from a museum here. <laughs> uh, we're very proud that we made this instrument known to a lot of people. And of course, last year, we were very proud to follow the fifth and perhaps the last of the series. Uh, who is fan of uh, Indiana Jones? <laughs> okay. Now, all this is based on uh, what uh, uh, Pythagoras and all of us since then we call more or less the music of the spheres. And uh, of course, it is based on. Uh, experimenting with the history says, or the mythology, if you like. Well, it's not mythology, but because it's written in many ancient books of the same era, that uh, Pythagoras constructed the musical scale when passing by a, a blacksmith, he listened to the noise of the hammers of the master and the students in the workshop hammering various things, or perhaps the same piece of metal one after the other, using various weights for the hammers and notice that it was musical. 
After that, he developed mathematically the scale. Of course, this scale we read in ancient musical instruments dated 40 or 50,000 years ago, almost the same in flutes. But uh, the first measurements, exact ones, have been made according to our, let's say, written mythology by Pythagoras. And this instrument is a development where look the numbers in the weights. Okay. Uh, this is the prototype for this type of instrument. This is an Iranian one, but we have the same here in Greece. But this is a very beautiful one. And you can still see them today in some uh, um, restaurants here in Athens, in some traditional ones. Not very easy these days, but when I was a child, that was a standard. <laughs> and we all, we, we all enjoyed it, of course. And uh, even a sort of uh, music played by uh, glasses uh, filled partly by water. You know, of course, this experiment, since you probably made it in the primary school. So we come back to this music of the spheres with uh, Pythagoras, who says that. Uh, the elements of the principles of nature, the elements of the principles of nature are numbers, are mathematics, I translated from the Greek, but he really means uh, mathematics. Although at the time they divide arithmetic by geometry and by stereometry. And Plato says to start philosophy, you have to master arithmetic, geometry, stereometry, um, harmony, which includes music, and astronomy. So, <laughs> these five things, we are included at least. <laughs> but of course, the prehistoric person, this is a Lyra of the fourth millennium BC. And we have at least uh, five, if not eight of them. Um, all of them come from the small islands in the center of the Aegean. And they are fourth and third millennium BC. And of course, to construct such a one, you really need to experiment quite a lot. And a good one, a small one, this size, has survived. And if, if you are mad with music, you have to go to the Archaeological Museum of Piraeus, you are, where you will see one. Uh, on the first floor, together with some partitures. Incredible, it has survived. <clears throat> so, this is the one that introduced properly mathematics with theory. Well, in fact, is Thales, the first one, according to our history, that introduces theoretical proofs. And Hero, the mathematician, an engineer, an inventor, and physicist, he uh, first created um, um, fluid dynamics. 
Now, he says that the largest step of the evolution of civilization with science is the introduction of theoretical proofs. And probably we all agree, I, I suppose, uh, because indeed you need it to understand thoroughly what you study in nature or even abstract things in uh, mathematics. And this is uh, uh, rephrased, this is again in Greek uh, what uh, Pythagoras uh, says. And here we have uh, again from an ancient book, uh, the resonances of the planets and how musical this is and how one can create and they have dances, not only in mainland Greece, but also in uh, Asia Minor, Minor in Anatolia and all over the uh, Greek world. And this one comes from uh, Kepler's book, where he gives uh, the music of the sphere, this music of every planet. Exactly the same way Pythagoras says. I mean, thank God we have it from uh, some of his disciples who wrote it down and later it has been published. And uh, in his book, Kepler gives, for example, the magical motion of uh, Mars, uh, which led him to the uh, development of the three laws. And uh, this is the resonance of Mars with the Earth. You are very familiar, of course. Here I'm trying to reproduce the 462 year periodicity and the eight year periodicity for the Olympians, of course. I don't leave it for 462 years. Well, here we have it for 462 years, but it's too complex. And you see all the planets. And again, here it's Mars. Well, of course, for a much longer period, and so on. Because you know this much better than me. So all these are in this case. And uh, we predict all the natural phenomena based on the laws of physics. And this is important. And the laws of physics are mentioned inside the mechanism, both in the program, which has survived in the gears, and we're very lucky, so combining the 32 gears that we've got, the pointers in the scales, which let us understand that this shows a calendar. It has months. The manual says 223. So it is sorrow cycle. It's prediction of eclipses. It also has the 19 years and so on. Uh, we have the conclusion that I have just uh, told you. Of course, it is based the construction on the knowledge Archimedes um, laws of uh, the levers, etc. Uh, 
the greatest advancement, in fact, in, uh, at the beginning of mechanics that he did before 212 BC. And he has constructed at least three instruments like this. One is the um, clock of Archimedes that has survived in at least 20 Arabic manuscripts of various times. We have very good uh, drawings of it, and it works with weights and counterweights. So it is a very important um, text for us to understand how this machine works continuously, as our group proposes, my Mexican friends and myself. Uh, not only based on this, on the other, on other things as well. And uh, that's how we reconstruct it. A few more words about the um, shipwreck. The shipwreck was found in this small island, Antikythera, here. It has uh, items from various places all around the Aegean archipelago, all these islands, including uh, Peloponnese, uh, mm, Lesbos, uh, Chios, Smyrna, uh, Samos, uh, Rhodes especially, Kos, you name it, all the islands. And this is Elias, the diver that discovered it. He first discovered the hand of this person. You will enjoy him in the museum if you go. Don't miss it. Very impressive. His eyes especially. And this boy, too. Probably Mercury. Ah, this is another interesting sofa. Louis XIV, probably and uh, several Muranos, very beautiful. And with this, more or less, I think we have uh, finished. Uh, of course, I can continue for very long. Uh, ask something, you can have a look at uh, the mechanism, so this replica, of course, over there. So, yeah, please, Francesca. Thank you very much, this is fascinating. Thank you. Um, can we say with how much accuracy they were able to predict things like the solar eclipses, for example? It seems that the accuracy is quite good because they use the Saro cycle, which we start today as well if, you want, if we want to predict an eclipse. Of course, then we, uh, we use uh, exact calculations these days with a computer. At that time, they were very good. Hipparchus, has written a book on how eclipses differ in middle latitudes, near the equator, or at the poles of the Earth. So they were very advanced. And unfortunately, the book has vanished. But, uh, and he has at least another two books about eclipses. So they were very advanced. Now, in, in the mechanism, somewhere here, it gives the description of eclipses 
exactly uh, this, how they go if you are in the northern or southern or near the poles. But unfortunately, it's very fragmented. We, we only have a couple of words that can be interpreted in terms of uh, observing an eclipse near the poles far, far from the equator. Because what it says is that the moon goes like this or like that, or like this, you see. So would it be like on the order of- Excuse me, the shadow of the earth, I mean, or the moon uh, on the sun. Yes. Would, would they be able to predict in the order of days, for example, like which day it would happen? Ah, this is easy. If you know the month, it's sufficient. Because of course, the eclipse occurs at new or full moon. So they know quite well, and they, all of them, give the hour, all of them. Now in this, we have two theories or views. One is of uh, uh, my friend, Professor Geren Henriksson of Uppsala, who is a spe who is specialized in, uh, amongst other things, ancient eclipses, including prehistoric. He took the 13 eclipses for which we know the hour, solar eclipses, and he calculated that all of them have been observed in Syracuse, some of them at the time of Archimedes, so by himself, and the rest of them by his students, obviously, after his death. Another view by my friend, young friend, uh, Aris uh, Vulgaris uh, from Thessaloniki, uh, says that they are predicted theoretically using the mechanism starting from an eclipse at the beginning of a series of eclipses, Esaros, which occurs at the perigee of the moon, which is theoretically very attractive uh, view, and that's why I present both of them, both of them to you. Now, the accuracy in theory was very good. Uh, the machine has the accuracy that the number of that the number of bits per byte permit. As we know very well, when you we, you want to have a good accuracy, you go more than sixty four bits, for example, <laughs> and you can readjust it every now and then. I mean, you come out. Uh, when the moon rises, for example, or something like that. And you set again the exact position of the moon. Every now and then. And that's sufficient. The same for the planets. Yes, please. Okay, hi. Hi. Thank you for the nice talk. I have a much simpler question. How big was it? I mean, the physical size of the uh, This is the, the, this the is right it? size. Ah, okay. Yeah. It was... Only the third dimension is a bit larger here. Okay. Uh, now, with the planets, it goes to this size, if not a bit larger. And according to our theory, it was with ornaments, something like these columns, for example, perhaps where it was outside, around. Yes. Okay. Uh, it had two doors, I mean, we have them, and the manual is on the doors. And perhaps it had some automata. A person, for example, showing the hour every hour. Or we know from descriptions that below it has weights and counterweights regulated by a water clock. And a very large one 
like this was in a, a very beautiful tower that you can see today in Athens. It's one kilometer and a half from here, uh, below the northern part of Acropolis. It's an octagonal ancient observatory with eight solar dials, nine in fact, all around. And uh, a water clock inside that has, that gives a float that goes up, let's say 10 centimeters every hour. In fact, the height is uh, one meter and a half, something like that, uh, 40 by 60 centimeters. And from ancient books, we read that it was a cork. It had, way, it had weights made of lead and a string or a chain, like the one of bicycles, that makes it work. So in total, it is this one. And the stand is perhaps one meter and a half or two meters, something like that and it contains a small water container. Well, this is a working hypothesis, of course. So that was the size. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Please. The first one is, uh, if I understood correctly, is that the input to the machine is the time um, and they know. So, which is the range where you like? How far can you reach to make predictions? Where years, centuries? Uh, well, according to the scales, is seventy-six years. But of course, you have to readjust it. Um, my watch, for example, till uh, well, I have it for, for almost twenty years. A uh, few years ago, I readjusted it properly uh, with uh, specialists. But before that, it was going one minute, um, it had one minute advance in, for every month. So every month I had to readjust it or, or it happened. You do the same and the accuracy you have is acceptable. The, the, the maximum error for the moon if you leave it for long, uh, can be one degree is too big. But you can readjust it every now and then. Yes. No, they were every four years. But the calendar, this eight-year calendar, that uh, probably was a universal calendar because we have it in the, till the, well, after the, even after the 12th century in Scandinavia, many other places, and the Christians have it for Easter again till the. 12th or other say 14th century. This is a lunisolar one, obviously, for Easter. And uh, you have years of uh, 12 lunar months, that some of them are of 30 days and others of 29. But every few years you have a 13 month added. One of the months is repeated twice. For this reason, one Olympiad, a four year period, is 50 months, lunar months. The next Olympiad is 49. And then again, the same. So you have a small difference for the beginning of the Olympics. 
but today it works properly. Still. And this year we have a problem with it. <laughs> yes. Please. You have, you have. Hello. Okay. I'm sure you have thought about this uh, very much. Such an amazing instrument uh, with such accuracy and very useful. But why, why do you think we haven't found another one? Or do you think there is a possibility we can find something similar or something exactly like this somewhere? Well, both. Uh, there is a continuation. And uh, now we are in the academy. The last, uh, let's say, academician uh, in, the, in Athens, after Plato, before the academy was stopped for a period, was Proclus. Proclus is, uh, uh, I think, the only uh, Greek mentioned in the prologue of the foreword of uh, uh, Newton's book. Um, he was a very important philosopher, very good in mathematics. Uh, physics uh, and astronomy. And he says that there are this type of instruments. Some of them are made of gold, royal ones. Some are made of copper, even less expensive that have dials made of marble, marble or stone, maybe. And even less expensive made of wood. When I read it, that was in 2004, I believe that all this was imagination. Uh, he also said that uh, these machines predict the perigee and apogee. A few years later, after our study, I discovered three of them made of wood in Iceland. These were made around 1780, according both to the director of the museum, the National Museum there, and uh, a member of our group who is a specialist in writings. Now, in between, we have only pieces of them. Of course, we have descriptions like uh, this Archimedes clock and other descriptions. We have also uh, the clock of Damascus that is a continuation. And in fact, is, it is much closer to descriptions by Hero because we have drawings of it. You see. We are very lucky to have drawings and uh, others in between. There is another description of the seventh century of the clock of Gaza. Now, in the central square of Gaza was a building, large building, that is uh, exactly, I believe, the clock of Damascus but with a, a Greek tint in the sense that you have 12 doors opening. We have it in the Damascus clock. And every hour, one door opens and Hercules comes and performs one of the 12 acts. And at night, you have 12 small windows and every, every one of them opens in the series at the beginning of the hour with a system described by Hero with a cylinder that turns automatically every hour and triggers the opening of the 12 doors or the 12 
windows with a pellet that drops from the from a large bird goes in a system of three um, levels, levels, let's say, with a sort of hemisphere in which a pellet uh, drops, and this way makes the thing to turn every hour. And uh, you have the same in the clock of Archimedes, and you can see the model of it if you go a few blocks south, just before, well, two streets before um, um, Sindagma, and uh, the Museum of Ancient Technology is there, where I bought this one, and uh, you can see this system of uh, pellets, etc. Well, part, part of it. Please. We have. Um... Hello? Yes. So maybe this is a bit of a, a naive question, but do we know exactly how this works? Meaning, can you actually turn and get these predictions? Or do we have a well-formulated theory of how the mechanism exactly worked inside? Uh, with uh, members of our Mexican group that are specialists in creating large size clocks, like the ones we have in buildings, we made this one at two sizes. This size and the and 10 times the original. So three meters and something. Uh, they both work continuously. Of course, these days with an electric motor. And they work properly. Although we have from time to time to reset the position of the moon. And the accuracy depends, as I said before, by the number of teeth. And uh, uh, it is acceptable, though, to use it for various practical reasons. For example, to measure the latitude, which is a very difficult thing, as you know, as we all know. And the Greek uh, geographies uh, were numerous. And uh, many of them are very accurate. They give coordinates of 8,500 places, starting from Iceland to half of China, all Indonesia. They give uh, the sizes of uh, almost all the, all the islands of Indonesia, which is very surprising, the width of the straits. Um, they give the position of 40 something cities from the eastern part of India to China. No, but what I say, no, no, this is in ancient Greek books. Do you know Menechmus? He's the inventor of uh, algebra, he really studied um, conic sections uh, with a kind of algebra. He went probably to Indo up to Indonesia 
uh, to create good, good maps. He's not the only one, of course. And uh, all these, I believe, have been made with simplified versions of this one, because this is too expensive. Now, why they disappeared? Why we have only one? One of the questions was, because we recycle metals today. And of course, at that time, there were periods, at war especially, that bronze was more expensive than iron. Excuse me, than gold. Of course, more expensive than iron. And uh, the best cannons at various periods were made by melting Greek uh, statues. Because for some reason, the metal was very good. And we know that they have melted a few thousand ancient Greek statues, and Roman ones, of course, to create cannons. So this is the reason that they have disappeared of recycling. As I said, I can talk perhaps for a semester. So <laughs> I think this will be the last questions by Manthos. Manthos, here it is. Microphone. Uh, please. No, 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 I have. Have you compared the accuracy of the mechanics with the mathematical models of Ptol 